And welcome back everyone to uh, the Kolecki and Kolecki Economics Conference. Uh, our next session um, is chaired by Leanne Usher and I am particularly very happy to introduce her since we go back a very long time, back to the new school some 20, more than 20 years ago um, when I was only in my early teens, I'm sure. <laughs> Uh, Leanne Usher is a visiting assistant professor in economics and finance at Bard College and associate editor of Frontiers Blockchain. She's a senior economist at the Hudson Valley uh, Current, a local currency cooperative, and blockchain research fellow at Wolfram Research. Her research specializes in monetary theory, market microstructure, computational economics, crypto economics, and the history of economic thought. She has publications uh, that has focused on the microstructure financial systems, systemic risk, agent-based modeling, <clears throat> or bottom-up microstructure financial systems, sorry, macroeconomics, network analysis of corporate finance, network analysis of local currencies, and more. Leanne is co-founder of the New York City Computational Economics and Complexity Workshop. She was affiliate scholar with the Institute of Advanced Sustainability Studies at Potsdam, Berlin. She was previously a senior researcher on blockchain ecosystems and consensus. She's a consultant of the CFA Institute of International Monetary Reform and Securities Analysis at the um, Reserve Bank of Australia. I'm very, to introduce, I'm very happy to introduce uh, Leanne, and you, the floor is yours. Thank you, Leanne. Thank you, Louis Philippe. Can I remind everyone, except the speaker, to mute your microphones? And I'm very happy uh, to introduce this session about Kolecki and Cambridge. We have Maria Cristina Mapuzo, who is a professor of political economy at the University of Rome, La Sapienza, Italy, and fellow of the Italian Academy of Lince. Uh, former president of the European Society for the History of Economic and the Italian Society for the History of Political Economy. She's worked on classical monetary theory, the Cambridge School of Economics, and Keynesian economics. She has published about 100 articles in journals and books, plus authoring or editing 20 volumes. Collections of her essays have been published by Rutledge, for example, Fighting Market Failure 2012, and recently by Cambridge Scholars Publishing Essays in Keynesian Persuasion 2019. It's my great pleasure to introduce Maria Christina, and I'm looking very much forward to the discussion. We have uh, 90 minutes, approximately, I would say around 45 minutes um, will be the discussion, but it's up to Maria Christina, and then we'll open the floor to questions. Please ensure that your microphones are muted and to raise your hand for the questions. We'll, we'll leave those to the end and I'll mention again how to do that. Maria, please. Thank you, Leanne. I'm particularly pleased that you are chairing this session. And I just would like to say a couple of words, thanking Louis Philippe for being able to have a planetary um, conference on Zoom in very difficult circumstances and um, I'm sure that everybody will join me in congratulating him for being able to put together such a such an interesting conference. Now I'm going to um, try to share the screen. I have a PowerPoint presentation which I thought might be helpful to you know to save time and everything. So I hope that I will be able to do so. Can you see that? Yes. Okay. So <laughs> this is Andy Worrell version of Kaleski, and I hope that you like the picture. Okay. So um, let me start by saying that, of course, there is so much ample literature on Kaleski and various aspects of his work and his importance. But I believe that there are still issues uh, which can attract uh, attention. And there are indeed uh, many theoretical debates on how to draw on, it, on its legacy. My paper, unfortunately, has a much narrow scope because it takes just a close look at the impact Kaleski had on Cambridge's major protagonists, 
and of course um, the impact that they had on him during the time he spent in Cambridge. Why, why am I doing so, apart from the fact that Cambridge is my pet subject? But uh, I think there is a, a good reason for doing so, because I think they are, they, to explore the connection between the two approaches, Kaleski and the Cambridge people, uh, is important because although they are distant in their inspiration, uh, they both form part of the theoretical constellation, which we recognize as the alternative to neoclassical economics. So I think that that's why the reason why these two different approaches, even if they are distant in inspiration, as I will try to show, they belong to the same, as it were, project uh, to develop an alternative to neoclassical economics. So uh, let me say that I'm, as you know, I'm an historian of economic thought. So I would like to draw a, a distinction here, which is not to be taken um, too seriously in the sense that the, the two things may overlap. But I think there is a, a, a difference between historical reconstructions and analytical reconstruction. Historical reconstruction of the event uh, is an understanding how they unfolded at the time. And this is only one aspect of the story that can be told because there is another route that can be pursued to explore this connection, namely post factum, not at the time, but later on uh, for people who follow, just to analyze similarity or complementarities in the two approaches. And in this case, you have to take into account the later development. So you have to make a jump in the time dimension and not just look at what happens at the time, but also what happens afterwards. And that's why I draw this distinction between an historical narrative and an analytical reconstruction. I think that the two are complementary, of course, they are not alternative but they uh, follow a different methodological, a different methodological implication. Of course, Kaleski theory evolved until his death in the 70s. So if I'm looking just a, a small uh, um, uh, time span, in a way I, may, I, I make a, a very limited account of his, of his development, but this is also the case for the Cambridge people. And if I'm looking at a couple of years in the 1930s, of course, I will be missing uh, development that happened, uh, you know, in, in the work of people, uh, Keynes, Kahn, Robinson, Caldos, and so forth. Uh, so by concentra concentrating on Kaleski Cambridge period, I take a very limited view of the matter. However, I hope that by taking a closer view, especially with the benefit of some unpublished correspondence, which I thought is the value added, if any, of my paper, what might be lost in depth and breadth of the picture, it might be gained in terms of the details. Okay, so let me uh, give you a brief outline of, of, the, of the presentation. So I start with a very brief summary of the well-known story of Kaleski encounter with the leading Cambridge protagonist and his visit there between 1936 and 1939. I discuss the criticism he received mainly from Keynes and Kahn, uh, but we will see also by John Robinson, in particular of the notion of the degree of monopoly and his role in explaining wage behavior in the cycle. So this is the scope of my narrative. I then turn on John Robinson's role in recruiting Kaleski to the post-Keynesian cause, followed by some general questions regarding the compatibility among different approaches within the post-Keynesian uh, constellation. And then I will finish with some concluding remarks in which I hope will be um, useful to start off a discussion uh, 
to which I'm very much looking forward to. Okay, so let's, let's review the timeline here. This is a very well known fact, but for the benefit of I hope young people or do not know um, the story might be useful very briefly to be reminded the main, uh, uh, the main uh, time post. Kaleski arrived in England in 1936 on a Rockefeller Foundation grant, spent the academic year mostly at the LSE. And then Caldor, I think he was already been uh, read by Jersey, uh, described his impact there, eventually emerging almost as an important figure. I must add that I, I mentioned the Perugia conference where Caldor was there. And as a matter of fact, I was driving him from Rome uh, to Perugia to attend the conference where he delivered the first of his several um, account of his memory of, of Kaleski. And then he asked me to stop for lunch. And then, uh, as you may know, Caldo was uh, uh, liked to eat well. And so we spent a lot of time, this was on the way back, sorry. The way back from the conference, he wanted to stop to lunch and enjoy the food in Umbria and so forth. And then I was anxious because, uh, uh, you know, we were making late for his flight. And then he had lunch and then he had the, uh, everything. And then on the way back to the airport, he said, what a silly thing to do to take me to lunch <laughs> when I was going to lose, uh, to uh, miss my play. Anyway, Caldor gave a very nice uh, piece on, on Kaleski in that occasion, which is published in the book edited by, by Mario Sebastiani. Anyway, sometimes in the summer of 1936, as we know, Kaleski met John Robinson and he made a lasting impression of her. As it is well known, she mentioned several times and as testified in the support she gave him on several occasions and the influence that he had on her work. Jesse, I think mentioned, but I might mention again that John Robinson also after Kaleski death I think was made a point to be very close to Ada Kaleski as well. So she, she developed a real closeness, also a personal level. While in Cambridge, Kaleski was very active in as Rafa seminar. Um, this is something that uh, is an unpublished letter in which, uh, but is quoted by Jersey as well. Uh, for instance, we have a letter from Zrafa to John Robinson in December 1938. Rothbard and Kaleski both come to my seminars and add considerably to the interest of the discussion, although they don't allow much to say to the research student, not even to the Americans. And this, of course, are Dunlop and, and, and Tarshis. She's becoming American rather than Canadian in the... <laughs> account uh, by, by Zrafa. So after a while, Kalexi was offered a research job at the newly created the Cambridge Research Scheme of the National Institute of Economic and Social Research into prime cost, proceed and output, which was set up at the end of 138, financed by the National Institute of Economic and Social Research. After one year, Kaleski presented the main result of his research, which met uh, with extremely critical comments by Keynes and Kahn, and to a lesser extent by, by John Robinson. As a result, Kaleski resigned and left Cambridge for Oxford, where he joined the Oxford Institute of Statistics, um, his salary is still being paid by the same uh, National Institute of Economic Research at the time was directed by Hall. Apparently, and this is the first unpublished uh, correspondence that I found, apparently Kaleski did not show any bad feelings if we are to believe to John Robinson account to Khan. Kaleski had swallowed the Oxford job without a murmur. Uh, however, six months later, she noted, I get a short and bitter letter from Kaleski from time to time. Anyway, he seems well dug in at Oxford. Okay, so we, we know that John Robinson uh, 
kept in touch with him to see how he was doing in Oxford. And this is a two unpublished letters. One is published in the uh, in, in the, the book I edited with Annalisa Rosselli on Cambridge Correspondence. However, uh, Kaleski's disappointment over the comments he received, which forced him to uh, leave Cambridge and to take up the Oxford job, must have troubled him deeply, okay? As the following letter to Khan amply demonstrate. This is a letter which has been reproduced both by uh, Jersey and by Jan in his biography. Anyway, let me read it to you. This is a letter to Khan. After Khan has handed him over, wrote to him the comments that uh, reflected what he, John Robinson and Keynes thought of his interim report, which was a summary of the results uh, during the, um, uh, his brief, uh, um, research work at the Institute. After a careful consideration of what you told me yesterday, I came to the definite conclusion that I would not stay for the next year in Cambridge. Do not consider it, please, a hysterical gesture. I formed the best possible expectations of my work in the next year, and I arrived at the result that I cannot venture the enterprise. The success of the inquiry I propose for next year is much less certain than what, what would have, could have been expected from my work next year. I thought that the latter was considered more or less satisfactory. I could risk a possibly negative result in the next year, but I cannot take the risk that two years will be considered wasted the more that I cannot promise him anything better for the next year. The rest of the time of this year, I should like to devote to bringing in order and the work done and writing a theoretical interpretation of the result. Okay, this letter has been uh, reproduced both by Jersey um, edition and by uh, Young biography. <clears throat> so the story of the Kaleski Cambridge Con connection has been amply documented in the literature. We just mentioned, obviously, Jan biography, but also Chris Lev and Harcourt. We, and uh, the literature, of course, <laughs> tried to answer the question of the reason why Cambridge was not and could not become the intellectual home for Kaleski. So it was not something that Kaleski did out of a uh, you know, inability to accept the criticism. And there was certainly a Joe Robinson use, you know, oil and vinegar, they do not mix. So there is no lack of evidence that the leading Cambridge economists were disappointed by his approach to cost analysis and prices formation within the project. And that there is no lack of evidence that Kaleki was not only convinced of the correctness or relevance of their criticism. Okay, they, he was not at all convinced because we have also the reply, you know, that the answers that he gave to the criticism he received. So we know exactly what both parts um, said. I think that Jan has given us a very balance. I really enjoy rereading it. I read it when it came out, but I read it for the purpose of this presentation. And I think that he gave us a very balanced and, and, and comprehensive account of both the efforts made by Khan in the name of Keynes, Ruff, and Joe Robinson, who made, they really tried to get the Kaleski job. There is a plenty of evidence of the intellectual respect they had for him. But also we have a plenty of evidence. And I think that Jan documented very well the reservation they had um, on his approach. In fact, what happens was that they were never fully persuaded by Kaleski, an orthodox approach. Why? Well, because this implied rejection of several Marshallian postulates, including, obviously, the assumption of rising marginal costs, which in the Marshallian framework is a necessary condition for determination of equilibrium under perfect competition. And this is one of the reasons why um, possibly Zrafa 
besides being a Marxist, as Kaleski, uh, thought Kaleski, considered Kaleski as a kindred soul, you know, because that was exactly the same point as Rafa has been doing, you know, that, uh, you know, the Marshallian assumption uh, were either logically incorrect or with no uh, realistic basis, okay? So, but what, the, what was Kaleski work like within the research scheme? Again, this is, a, I'm telling something that for anyone who has uh, read Kaleski or studied Kaleski is very well known, but let me summarize for people who might not be so familiar. What Kaleski did was to collect data on industrial production by industry and to uh, um, calculate and to, uh, uh, measure the share of prime cost, labor and raw materials in the total output of the coal, cotton, steel, tobacco, shipbuilding, electricity supply industry. And what was the purpose of such analysis, which by the way, was something that Keynes didn't exactly get because he asked repeatedly, what is the point of this exercise? Well, Kaleski said to show that the standard Marshallian upward sloping average or marginal cost curve were not characteristic of production. Instead, there was a stable prime cost, the cost of wage and raw material, that was the basis of industrial price formation. Okay, so it is very explicit, and this is a point that Jersey made very clearly in his edition, that that was clearly a purpose of the exercise for. for for uh, Kaleski, who had made the same assumption, as we all know, in the article uh, published in, in, in Poland. And I think that Kilosi made the point very early on, and again, Jersey acknowledged this in his edition, saying that Kilosi showed that in the early papers in Polish, Kaleski was already clear that that was the point, to show the rising marginal costs were not um, a, a true representation of what was going on in reality. <clears throat> in fact, Kaleski explicitly stated that his purpose has been to verify where diminished return were in operation. Of course, diminished return, uprising uh, marginal cost are the basis of, of, of supply and demand analysis. If you reject that, then the whole um, structure of the argument become um, untenable. And I think that Jan put it very, very nicely in a nutshell, Kaleski refusal to fit price theory into Marshallian methodology condemned his research project. And I, I really fully agree. There is a little bit of disagreement on other part in Jan's uh, paper, uh, book, but that I reserve for the paper, not for the presentation. <laughs> but it's minor, a minor point. Um, so, and it is understandable, uh, the relationship between Keynes and Kaleski <clears throat> has understandably attracted the most of the attention in the literature. So there is, it has been mentioned even here, you know, many, many aspects that have been analyzed whether they are similar, whether the difference, and whether who comes first, and so on. Here, I will concentrate on one aspect only, okay? Not all the question of Kaleski and Keynes' relationship. The approach to price theory and the doubts he was met with regarding the soundness of his assumption. As you know, Kale Keynes were very, were a stickler when it comes to assumption, okay? He was always, uh, even the general theory is full of remarks and the basis accusation to neoclassical theory for him, it was that it was hidden assumption that needed to be. So also in the case of Kaleski, he was looking for the kind of assumption that made his argument sound or not. Okay, So that's what I'm trying to, to look at. So when Kaleski came up with the explanation of the constancy of the wage rate in the cycles, which had puzzled Keynes, um, again, this is an unpublished letter. I think I published it myself for the first time. Keynes had written to Zrafa to ask 
his research students, among which Kaleski was not a research student, but was attending, nevertheless, uh, Zrafa seminar, um, Keynes asked Zrafa to ask his research student to wreck their brains to find an explanation of why, you know, the constancy of the wage rate in the cycle. And when Kaleski came up with, with the answer, he was not happy. He, he, he did not convince Kaleski answer, which will, which is a well-known explanation of, of the balancing effect of the degree of monopoly. He did not convince neither Kahn nor, nor, nor Kahn. In an article mining rope, unfortunately, I discovered many, many, many years ago, I have already discussed the issue at length. So Sufit is here to summarize the main point. People who are interested can go back to the rope 1996 article. So what Kaleski did was to classify a uh, firm according to the shape of their average cost curve, increasing cost and then decreasing, and show that the stability of the wage rate in national income can be accounted for by the offsetting effects of the behavior of the degree of monopoly and of the ratio of turnover to income. And the uh, ratio, sorry, this is a, a repetition. And this is what it come out, comes out from the famous 1938 article. So what was the criticism of this argument? Why it was not convincing to Keynes and to, uh, and to Kahn? Uh, before I get to, to this, I uh, would like to mention again something which is well known, that the research, the empirical work done by Dunlop and Tarshish, who analyzed the behavior of real wages in the US and the UK, uh, with a view to testing the proposition, uh, show that uh, the, the result that Keynes had produced in the general theory, namely that real wages were expected to vary in the opposite uh, direction of money wages, was wrong. And they show that the real money wages vary in the same direction. And uh, these findings, which was the intuition by Kaleski and the empirical work by Dunlop and Tarshish, led Keynes to admit the possibility that constant marginal costs may be an important factor in accounting for the positive correlation between the real and money wages, which was exactly Kaleski's point. Anyway, he remained throughout skeptical of the procedure uh, Kaleski, sorry, typo, adopted to explain the constancy of the wage rate. So uh, Kaleski had come up with an explanation. This explanation was based with rejecting uh, Keynes' assumption, which was based again on assuming rising marginal cost, in this case, uh, wage cost and Keynes was not was not convinced. Although, as we will see, he admitted later on that he had made a mistake in making that assumption. Nor Kahn was persuaded. Okay, not even Kahn was persuaded by the argument put forward by by Kaleski. In an interview with me, which I'm very pleased has now been, I mean, an interview which goes back to the mid '80s. Uh, which was published in Italian, but thanks to Tony Aspromorgus, is now published in the Australian History of Economics Review. It just came out. This is online now. Um, uh, Khan told me, if Kaleski's conclusion, real wages were not lower at the height of the boom that in the slump, was, if, if Kaleski's conclusion was valid, Keynes attributed this validity to a curious coincidence that, for some reason not clearly explained by Michael Kaleski, with the rising level of output, the degree of imperfection of competition increases to the extent that offset the fall in productivity of labor working on the least efficient plans. So that's some, something that Kant told me in the mid 80s and the, the full interview is now available in English. If you're interested, you can look it up. So the main criticism by Keynes, Kahn, and Robinson of Kaleski result within the research scheme was level at the notion of degree of, monopo of monopoly. 
which was questioned, for instance, as not being a thing in itself in a three pages comment, unsigned, but most certainly written by John Robinson. Now, she wrote three pages in which she said, well, this degree of monopoly is, is, is very, is, is a sort of empty concept. It's not a thing in itself until, um, unless you tell me exactly what, what are the reason why uh, it varies in the cycle. And um, uh, the argument is that degree of monopoly depends on several factors, different various kind of market imperfection, wages changes, state of demand. And see, this is uh, John Robinson. To say that there has been a change in the degree of monopoly is never a final account of what has happened. And it is often unreasonable to expect a constant degree of monopoly in face of other changes, for instance, and change in demand. Uh, even Kahn was never in favor to abandon the hypothesis of profit maximization, which of course implies uh, that uh, you find an equilibrium point uh, between uh, marginal, marginal revenue and marginal cost. The marginal cost must be rising if you want to find uh, a point of equilibrium in perfect competition, since the demand curve is perfectly horizontal. He was never in favor of uh, abandoning profit maximization in the standard way of, of establishing the, the equilibrium point, although he insisted that this should be interpreted as a trial and error method rather than an optimizing rationality or something that is uh, consciously um, pursued on the basis of some calculation that the entrepreneurs really managed to do. You know, it's a sort of uh, way of, uh, of uh, explaining why particular firms are successful than others, because by trial and error, they manage to better profit and maximize than others, not because the entrepreneurs are better in calculating <clears throat> the optimum position. So he never accepted explanation of the price formation mechanism of the descriptive type or based on a hypothesis of no rational uh, behavior or hitch and hole or something that would um, explain behavior on different grounds. And this is a constant element throughout this uh, work. Uh, he of course, uh, regarded the price formation theory based on what the entrepreneurs say they do, as the famous article by Olenich, is a match to his resection of Kaleski markup price information. So he never bought any story, even if uh, it is strange, as we will see, because he was the invented of the inverted L shape cost curve. So that's, that's something, again, a little bit of an odd position. So let me get to John Robinson. Well, at the time, the uh, apparatus John Robinson chose to object to Kaleski came straight from the economics of imperfect competition, which was an approach which he abandoned later, certainly under the influence of Kaleski and, uh, and of Zraffa. Okay, so at the time she was still working under uh, the, with the, with the tool he, she had uh, put forward in the economics of imperfect competition. But we will see, as we know, that she abandoned that approach. And I think that Kaleski was really instrumental together with Rafa to make her change her mind. And in fact, in the second edition of their book, in which as we, you may re recall, she said that the book was a blind alley and she dismissed it, the second edition. Uh, in the preface, she acknowledged prices are formed by setting a cross margin in terms of percentage of prime cost to cover overhead amortization and net profit. Okay, so she acknowledged that uh, in the second edition, we are late, late 60 already, uh, that, that, that the way in which prices are formed However, she still believed that Kaleski degree of monopoly could not fully suffice to account for price determination. 
because some long period elements, as she said, had to be allowed for. And that's why she thought that uh, um, uh, so Rafa prices of production could be made use of. And uh, in the late 70s, she said that post Keynesian must make use of Rafa to build up a type of long period analysis, which would prevent your classical equilibrium from moving back into the general theory. So it was okay for short period analysis to use markup, to use Kaleski approach, but then you, you should have also some long period uh, um, instruments uh, to avoid to get back to the neoclassical story. Okay, there are, going back again to John Robinson, there are several inaccuracies in Robinson's later account of Kaleski's initial reaction to the general theory, which I'm very pleased now to recall. I dig out in my drawers and I found a letter that Jersey wrote to me in October, 1985, okay? And he told me, let me record that Mrs. Kaleski strongly denies that Kaleski might have said what uh, John Robinson attributed uh, in the two sentences in your quotation uh, after her. And this is what uh, Robinson said, which is very well known. Everybody has bought it. I confess I was ill. Three days I lay in bed. Uh, you know, when he discovered that the general, when he was in Stockholm and discovered that the general theory has been published. And Jesse said, not only Mrs. Kaleski does not recall, recall any such illness, and she was uh, together with her husband in 1936. Moreover, she's almost certain it could not have happened. This, she said, would be totally contradictory to her husband's character and nature to become ill and stay in bed for three days for such a reason. I'm afraid we have no means to support either of the two claims. Fywell, who also mentioned Kaleski's illness, took the information from Joan. However, from my own memory of Kaleski as a man and what I'm told by others who knew him, I tend to think that Mrs. Kaleski's memory is closer to the fact the scene, the scene painted by John Robinson, allegedly after Kaleski, seems to me very un Kaleski and spirit. I was so glad that I kept this letter and I was so glad that I managed to recover it and to present it here. However, uh, uh, if I went, I went back to my correspondence, again, the historical reconstruction of what happens at the time, uh, Robinson's early impression of the first encounter with Kaleski, I think corresponds to her later reminiscences. Not what she said afterwards, but what she said at the time, okay? And this is a letter to Khan. My Paul is a really intelligent man, though lacking in charm. His claim to have anticipated a lot of the general theory substantiated by an article in Econometrica written in 1933 is really possible to talk to, is really possible. What a change. He's interested in the James Roy business about investment, inducing investment. If you have got just paper, bring it along and I will bring the Paul's product. I want to see how they fit together. And even if at the beginning she was not convinced, as I show you by Kaleski approach to, to cost and prices, as, he, as, as she wrote to him, Keynes system is unrealistic, but yours is troublesome because marginal prime cost, as you define it, is not equal to marginal revenue or is only equal if entrepreneurs are very foolish. It falls short of marginal revenue, but some vague, vague margin corresponding to Keynes marginal user cost. So she wrote to him, say, I don't buy your story, but um, as we will see in the end, she was um, convinced that Kaleski, after all, might have been right, at least for the um, short period. I have here, um, I'm running, am I running? out of time, I mean, just five minutes, or can I take yeah, another? You, yes, you can, you can, can take I another take five minutes. Another 10 minutes, or is that sure. okay? Yeah, yes. Right. So Kaleski, in, in his article, has constructed a marginal labor cost curve and a marginal value added curve. Both derive by subtracting respectively from the prime cost curve and the marginal revenue curve, supposed to be decreasing the cost of raw material. The curves were derived for the individual firm and then aggregated for the system as a whole in the determination of the short period equilibrium level of output. 
the position of the marginal labor cost is fixed by assumption in the short period, since obviously we are in the short period, so capital equipment is fixed. But the position of the marginal value added curve depends on the level of the capitalist expenditure or the basis of the well-known Kaleskian assumption according to which only capital is saved and can change their level of expenditure. Thus, the marginal value added curve moves until the short period equilibrium is reached. It's not clear whether Robinson at the time is objecting to an equilibrium defined at the point of intersection between the MVA curve and the MLC curve, or to a lack of a specific assumption. And this is a point they continually stress. There is no specific assumption of entrepreneur behavior when choosing the level of a firm file. We are left with no indication how entrepreneurs make their decision. Uh, it, if, even if it is not clear exactly the, the, in detail the objection, what it is clear that she, at the time she was not ready to follow Kaleski in his abandonment of the profit maximization rule as Kahn was. The difference is that Kahn remained of the same opinion until the end of his life. Why John Robinson change it? Nevertheless, all these objections, shortly after their first encounter, John Robinson started supporting Kaleski. Okay, she was critical, but she was so impressed by his quality, as she said, I made it my business to blow his trumpet for him. In turn, as we know, Kaleski has substantially influenced on the development of her thought and in particular in her appreciation of Marx. So even if she had some reservation on the methodology employed by Kaleski, by a couple of years later, again, this is an unpublished letter to Kahn in 1939, I have decided to okay the Kaleski document. Yes, it set it out very clearly and makes a lot of remarks to point out that the estimates are not exact, but huh? so I think our former harsh remarks have done good. Okay, so she started moving away from the idea that uh, these results were not entirely sound, and he accept most of the reply and the changes that that Kaleski did. It's the same story that we know about the famous article that. Um, uh, she had to defend against Keynes' criticism. She went back to Kaleski, tried to persuade him to change something. And there is a point in which he said, I despair. I don't know if I can do more, but I tried to persuade him to accommodate Keynes' need and so on. So she was really trying to um, be uh, helpful in a way, you know, to try to, to be an interface between Kaleski and the people who had a, a different approach to cost and, and, and to, uh, to price theory. Uh, so Kales uh, Robinson made a staunch defend of Kaleski approach in face of Keynes criticism, that was 1939-1940. And uh, as we know, uh, the influence on her is very well documented by um, Chrysler and Harcourt which I think uh, they build on a work done, I think, for the first time by Tonya Zimakopoulos, uh, who was the first one, I think, who wrote the paper on the relationship between Kaleski and, and Robinson. Um, the methodological differences between the two are also well documented. Again, uh, I, I pick up three favorite in order of chronological order, Chrysler, 87, Osiachinsky, Toporowski, and need, uh, I should have added uh, Tom Sawyer's as well, but um, sorry, Malcolm Sawyer as well, but uh, I will quote him later on the paper. So here, let me focus on a different um, uh, point. Um, uh, what are the implications of following either Kaleskian or Keynesian route for the post-Keynesian economics, for today's economics? What are the implications? And I draw here a very nice article by Carabelli and Cedrini in post Keynesian economics, in which they uh, are very detailed and very. Um... So I believe that the superiority of Kaleski uh, version of the theory uh, um, demand, there is no doubt 
that was originally argued by John Robinson. John Robinson was the first who really <clears throat> said, look, if we want to construct post-Keynesian economics, Kaleskian route is better than. When one may say that for a little bit, maybe thought, she said that after Keynes' death, but Keynes died in 46, so uh, she had time to uh, ponder over this matter. The constructive element of post-Keynesian economics, she said, comes from Kaleski version of the general theory rather than Keynes. And she later added, Kaleski was able to weave the analysis of imperfect competition and effective demand together. And it was this that opened up the way for what goes under the name of post-Keynesian economics. Why? Why was Kaleski better? What were the reasons she gave? Well, Kaleski background is Marxist allow a better integration of Marx insights. Kaleski dual approach to price determination, supply and demand for primary commodities and markup, she said, are closer to reality. And, and so Kaleski is better. If you want to understand the real world, you have to take the Kaleski route. Even if, of course, Kaleski doesn't have everything and then you need to supplement gains. But as far as prices and, and as far as the <clears throat> Uh, integration with Mark inside, uh, Kaleski is much better. So, as we know, the post Keynesian economics, according to John Robinson, uh, is the classical tradition of Rafa, Ricardo, Marx, diluted, she wanted a little bit of Marshall, and of course, uh, Keynes and, and Kaleski. It's quite a hotspot, as we know, uh, and she was herself. Uh, aware of a difficulty of achieving such an integration of so different as, um, strand of thought, inspiration. Uh, but uh, that's what she has given us as a legacy. The post-Keynesian theory reaches back to class B ends of Ricard and Marx, skipping over the 60 years of dominance of neoclassical doctrines. This accounts for the paradox that post-Keynesian analysis derives equally from two such apparently incompatible sources, incompatible sources, as Piero Zraffa interpretation of Ricardo and Michael Kaleski interpretation of the theory of employment. So I thought I would like to end um, this presentation raising the point of this compatibility issue. And because the incompatibility issue is what lies behind many disagreements among us, among post-Keynesian economics, even if no one would question the importance and significance of Kaleski uh, in any attempt to overcome neoclassical economy. Um, Joe Robinson thought that um, Kaleski was free and free us from the element which Keynes has failed to throw off. And so Kaleski allowed us to get rid of many implications that uh, in a way dump the possibility of using um, some of Keynes' assumption. And uh, thanks to Zraffa and Kaleski, the initial incompatibility between the continental Marxist tradition and the Cambridge approach is overcoming post-Keynesian economics, I think, for those who believe that this initial incompatibility can be in a way accommodated. And there is no doubt that it was John Robinson who spent their uh, last part of her life trying to put these things together, okay? So what are the questions? Uh, I think, what are the relevant questions to conclude? I think that the point of the superiority of Kaleski doesn't lie in the assumption in perfect competition. Uh, I think that this is not, this is not the main point. The main point is that Kaleski give us the possibility of having a theory of effective demand without the Marshallian postulate. Because this postulate has a very damaged effect on the Keynesian message. And what is the damaging effect? The idea that to reduce unemployment, wages need to be cut. And even if, of course, we know that Keynes' argument is not, the causality doesn't go to falling wages, rising employment, in the neoclassical synthesis, in the end, the inverse relationship between wages and employment becomes a powerful tool to the idea that if you want to increase employment, you need to cut wages. And this is what Keynes misgave. And he explained the reason of this mistake in which he said, well, I thought it was in 
conformity with the more fundamental generalization and industry subject to increasing marginal cost in the short period. And so he said, and, and also accused Khan to have led him in that direction. And very clearly, this again unpublished letter, a letter to Tar, she said, it is clear that I made a mistake in saying the real wages usually fall when money wages are rising. There are two or three explanations of why I came to make the mistake, and which of them is correct is not very clear to me. So by keeping the assumption of rising marginal cost, Keynes was led to believe that the relations between money wage and real wage was an inverse one. And even worse, he was led to believe there was uh, an inverse relationship between real wages and employment. So Kaleski is better because there is no such an assumption that decrease in marginal productivity or labor in the system. Uh, with a similar argument, we can use the principle of effective demand when that there's no need to endorse the markup price determination. If you are a post-Keynesian that like to have a Zrafa production prices instead, but the important thing that you have the principle of effective demand that doesn't have the marginal product, decreasing marginal productivity. Um, and this is a point which is very similar to the one which been debating whether it's roughly compatible with Keynes. And, uh, you know, uh, that's why I think that historical investigation and theoretical construction are different exercises. When you want to make an integration, you might be not completely um, uh, faithful to the original formulation, but then you engage in another, in another process. So why it is closer to the truth to say that Cambridge economics and Kaleski economic have different vision and analytical tools, it is legitimate, I think, to pursue the goal. I don't think to integrate them. That not, I don't like the word to integrate them. I, I think to make use of both of them as the problems in hand may require. And what we have to do is to abandon the idea that there is one unified theory in which you accommodate Kaleski, Keynes, Rafa, only one box of tools. Um, we, do, we have to give up the commitment to one all-purpose model, and this is the way out. So concluding remark, I think we can admit that Kaleski finding in its interim report might have not been entirely satisfactory, and some of the criticism he received were justified. And this is what the best commentator of Kaleski's work um, agreed, and, and also explained the reason of the rift between him and Cambridge. Zrafa accepted Keynes, Scan, and John Robinson, John Robinson of the 1930s, were thinking within the Marshallian framework of price determination, and quite rightly, found Kaleski approach to be incompatible with it. Keynes was opposed to Keynes' unstated assumption, and he didn't like the sweeping generalization from a limited set of data. And the odd case also is Kahn, because Kahn had invented in the L-shaped cost curve. So the, the, the costs were um, constant until the full uh, uh, utilization of resources. And then he abandoned it in his multiplier article. And this is why Keynes said it was can fault if I accepted that assumption. I, I have an explanation why, why Kahn um, um, changed his mind, but um, this is, would be a matter of another paper, which in any case I've already written, so I can refer it to you. When Zrafa produce uh, production of commodity it was shown to the world that we could have prices without any marginal analysis in the long period. So in the end, we, we, as Poskensia, we know that we can have a theory of price that doesn't need any marginal calculation. And as a result of Kaleski and Zraf, John Robinson changed her tune, and by the early 50s, she became converted to approach to prices and distribution, which freed her and us <coughs> from the conclude. So I conclude by saying John Robinson was the midwife of what she herself christened the post Keynesian economics, while Kaleski, alongside Marth, Keynes, and Zrafa, constitute, I believe, the pillars upon which it stands. Thank you, and sorry for taking a little bit more time. No, Maria Christina, thank you so much. That was so interesting. Um,
we have 30 minutes for questions. So I think we have uh, quite a bit of time. And I'm going to um, first tell you to raise your hand if you wish to ask a question. If you click on the participants um, icon at the bottom of your screen, and then you will see the participants on the bottom left, you will see a blue hand to click on to raise your hand. So I will first ask Amateva Dutt, who's had his hand up for quite some time, and, and then I'll go on to Leonardo Vieira. Okay. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Maria Cristina, for a very interesting talk. Um, I, I want to make just three quick points. Um, the first is you don't go very much into how Kalachki was influenced by Cambridge, although I think you mentioned that you would do that. And in my own judgment, although not, not very well informed, is that it pushed Kalachki into detour trying to uh, explain his marker pricing with optimizing rules uh, based on marginal cost. There are a number of papers where he did that and I don't think it got anywhere. So fortunately he gave it up. Um, regarding uh, Cambridge's influence, uh, sorry, how, how Kalechki was received in, in Cambridge, um, uh, it is kind of ironic that the reason for, uh, for the early criticisms and even later continued uh, efforts was what Keynes described as my long struggle to escape. And this is actually something that, that is not just about Keynes, but about uh, the Cambridge School, essentially insisting on profit maximization, where Kalechki really was, didn't care. It's a methodological issue, not, not an issue of, of whether firms actually maximize profits. They, they simply cannot do that uh, outside uh, a very neoclassical framework. Uh, so uh, I, I think the lesson one can learn from your account to some extent, and I had this suspicion, is that Cambridge's reaction and perhaps the reaction of, of much of heterodox e economists early on was one, because of Cambridge's hubris to thinking that they were this monopolists of, of uh, what it meant to be. Uh, this explains not only, uh, for example, the, the love for optimization, marginal cost, uh, Keynes, Marshallian method, uh, all of this. And I've heard even some pe people from Cambridge saying that uh, time is, a, uh, is invented not to make everything happen at once and space is invented so that everything doesn't happen in Cambridge. And, and I, I, I find this uh, not only hubristic, but, but also intellectually very problematic. Uh, so, so even the attempts to integrate Strafa, Keynes, uh, Kalechki together, I think continues with that. And I quite agree with you that, that although it might make sense to look at it in those terms, it, 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 uh, it actually uh, loses track of many important differences as well. Uh, one last point is, is Robinson talking of Kalechki as my pole and Keldor, as we learned from uh, uh, Dr. Osiansky's uh, early, early discussion of Keldor's reaction to Kalechki's accent, you know, also seemed to suggest some sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, British superiority uh, sense. Uh, and now, of course, American superiority sense. Anyway, so I thought, I thought I'll ask you about these things. Um, thank you very Maria. much. I, I, I think that uh, you made a very interesting comments and I entirely agree with you. Also, I didn't get into the question of uh, Kaleski influence, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Cambridge uh, uh, impact on Kaleski. Uh, certainly he was forced, he was forced to reply to their criticism. He was forced uh, when he submitted his article to Keynes to make clear their assumption. And so I think that, I don't think that they influence him in terms of substance. He remain of his, uh, but I think they help him to put uh, the argument in a better shape. The, remember that he had a big problem with English when he came to England, when he came to London, his English 
uh, I think that Jan uh, biography tell us that he was staying in Russell Square somewhere and he had somebody to come and give him uh, English lessons. So for him, language was also a problem. And that's Caldor mentioned it, um, um, Keynes mentioned it. So I think that was not just a matter of uh, uh, clarification of concept. He, he could not, you know, express himself as well as the others. So I, I agree with you that this, uh, this, this was a problem. And the other two points, yes, I agree entirely with you. So, and uh, well, about uh, Cambridge chauvinism and Cambridge, uh, I think that, you know, for your country, maybe know uh, something about it as well. <laughs> <laughs> Leonardo Vera. Well, thank you very much, Maria Cristina, for this very exciting presentation, uh, stimulating also. Uh, I have three uh, quick questions. Uh, the first one is that uh, it's related to this move of Kaleski from Cambridge to Oxford. And since in the audience we have a lot of young people interested in in uh, this, how the micro foundations, the pricing and costing mechanisms that post Keynesian economy support. I think it's important to know what is in Oxford or uh, that Kaleski moved to Oxford uh, and maybe I work on the Oxford econo Economist Research Group and what they were doing at that time. Uh, uh, in addition, my second question is uh, regarding your your, um, um, what you say regarding Joan Robinson's second edition on imperfect competition. You, sa you said, or I interpreted as Joan Robinson very early recognized that, uh, that pricing was related to a gross margin that was added to cost in order to obtain prices. And, and then, uh, then, uh, you put Robinson as rejecting uh, optimization, rational optimization. I believe that Joan Robinson abandoned that later, but not in the second on the second edition of Imperfect Competition. And uh, and I would like a word on that. Maybe I'm wrong. And the third question is, uh, you know, three big or oh, two two uh, important research programs of Kaleski were business cycles and pricing. You uh, basically talk about pricing and costing. Uh, but uh, I, I, I want to know a little bit more on uh, what Kaleski thought about the degree of monopoly and the business cycle, how the degree of monopoly is related to the business cycle. Is the degree of monopoly procyclical or uh, anticyclical? And, uh, and, and this is uh, something that is quite important for um, post Keynesian economies working on macro models because most post Keynesian macro models assume that markup is constant over the business cycle and they don't want you know to complicate the model introducing the effects of business cycles on the markup. So a word on that will be very very uh, welcome. Thank you very much. Um. Thank you very much for, for your question. Um, the move of Cambridge to Oxford and whether working in Oxford um, certainly uh, helped Kaleski to pursue a kind of type of analysis that uh, in the end led him also to write uh, uh, important papers that show that there was a development in his thinking. So certainly had he been in Cambridge, I think, he would have not benefited so much as he did by staying in that environment. So in the end was uh, an unintended consequences that uh, brought uh, the situation to him, was more congenient to him, I think. Second edition of, the, I, sorry, I, I, I think you're right. I, I, might have, I, might say, I might have said in a way that is not right. I, I, the, the second edition, of course, the economics of perfect competition remained the same. She did not revise the book. She wrote a new preface in which she said, this book led me to a blind alley, okay? So what I meant is that in the preface, she in a way renounced to the approach 
and that she said that repeatedly in, any, in many other occasions, she felt that that approach was not the right one. So although the, the second edition remained the same, the preface is an acknowledgement that in the end, she decided that that approach need to be abandoned. So that's what, uh, uh, there is a famous sentence in which she said, this is, was a blind alley, you know, rather than following Marshall, I followed Pigou and, and I work on static assumption and that was a mistake. Uh, degree of monopoly. Certainly, Kaleski did not think that degree of monopoly was a constant. He had a, uh, if you read the uh, Jersey uh, edition of Siachinsky uh, notes, you can see how he got back continuously to the notion of what happens to degree of monopoly in a boom, in a depression, whether the, the, the degree of competition increases, decreases. I mean, I think that the fact that he's been criticized so much in Cambridge on the degree of monopoly, and not only on Cambridge, because um, there is a very, very nice account by Osiachinsky of how his concept was received and criticized at the time. And, uh, and it shows that Kaleski went back and back trying to answer to this criticism. So certainly he did not believe the degree of monopoly was constant. Thank you. Um, Louis Philippe. Oh, you're muted. Thank you very much. As a host, I don't have the option of raising my hand. <laughs> um, Christina, your, your presentation, uh, look, I could ask you 25 questions, all very interesting. I thought it was an excellent presentation. Uh, one comment, uh, I guess, clash question, is from what I get at towards the end, you seem to be arguing that, and I would agree with that if that's what you're arguing, that this heterodox tent should be a very eclectic one, um, if I understand uh, what you're saying, and I would agree with that. Uh, second, um, I wanted to ask a question that Amiteva wanted to ask in the previous uh, or uh, during the Osiatinsky, I guess, presentation and didn't get to, and I think it's just as relevant here, when you're talking about how uh, Kiletsky's main uh, 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 contribution was about, about effective demand and uh, without the Marshallian uh, uh, presuppositions, postulates. And then you mentioned Cambridge superiority. Uh, it makes me wonder, and this is Amitava's question, where does the word name post-Keynesian comes from, as opposed to post-Kalekian economics? Both PKs, but I wonder if you have a, an opinion on why we ended up calling it post-Keynesian, especially since Joan Robinson was so influential in various aspects, uh, various aspects of, of what became post-Keynesian economics. Why do you, it was not called post-Kalekian from the start? Thank you. Well, one has to be reminded that although John Robinson was a great admirer of, um, of Kaleski, uh, she, I mean, the hero of, of all Cambridge story remains Keynes. Uh, and Keynes is not just uh, effective demand, Keynes is uncertainty, Keynes is liquidity, Keynes, uh, I mean, there are a lot of things that uh, John Robinson herself said, uh, Kaleski doesn't have it. Kaleski is important for the, she stresses a lot this imperfect competition business. I, I, as I said, I don't think that this is, the, the real difference is not the assumption of markup pricing. The real difference is that you don't have a Marshallian uh, um, foundation in the theory of effective demand. But one has to be reminded that, uh, you know, John Robinson spent all her life uh, trying to argue against bastard Keynesians, against uh, uh, what she thought rightly as uh, um, misunderstanding in Keynes and so forth. So she fought to have Kaleski uh, be recognized as an important component of the theory of effective demand, but Keynes was the hero of the story throughout her life. Um. Jerry Corvisanos, you're on mute. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, Maria, thank you very much. I too enjoyed very much your talk. 
Um, my question is because recently I've had to review a book on pluralistic economics and its history where you wrote a paper on the question, is there a Cambridge approach? Mm. And I, I enjoyed reading that and what you said today. And together, I asked the question that in your, when you actually state the Cambridge approach, you, you very much looked at Marshallian framework as a reductionist one. And you, you say that that approach, particularly with the assumptions and so on, is a, quite a closed system. And Kalecki has, and we heard from Peter Chrysler and Joseph Halevi, how he, he has a much more open system. And I'm wondering whether it's, it's the, more the macro foundations of effective demand and the opening it up from that perspective that drove Kalecki, where the Marshallians come from a micro foundations and therefore that's where the, the clash comes. The second question is on the term post-Keynesian economics. That refers back to Louis Philippe's question. It, it actually rose in America um, a, as a term in the late 70s and came with Paul Davidson. And my raising of Paul Davidson um, tells me and informs me that post-Keynesian economics is not a homogenous group of economists. And I appreciate you talking about post-Keynesian in the context of the Cambridge approach, but there is a much broader group of post-Keynesians who don't see integration at all. Like my attempts to publish Kaletskian papers under Paul Davidson's um, editorship of the post-Keynesian economics is, 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 is wasted given his lack of interest and belief in Kaletskian economics. So we've got to understand there are very many ways and I agree there's no integration, but there's not, there's even sometimes quite a lot of distance between them. So is that, uh, should we be talking more about the Cambridge approach to post Keynesian that you were referring to in relation to Kalecki? Thank you very much. Two very interesting questions. Um, I believe that the word post Keynesian economics was invented by Joe Robinson. Uh, I think that she started pretty early. I remember, might have said in the early 70s, 73 or 74. So the wording was her, okay? And what she believed was the post-Keynesian economics was a combination, as I said. Then post-Keynesian economics becomes, even nowadays, uh, to indicate very different uh, and altogether um, conflicting views of what should be in it, what should be in the bag. Uh, you mentioned Paul Davidson. I think that Paul Davidson believed that, K that Kaleski didn't have the theory of effective demand as well developed as, as Keynes, or uh, people believe that Zafa should not be part of it because we want to have Minsky rather than, than Zafa. So, I mean, if we get into the geography of post-Keynesian economics, I think we have so many variety. And that's what I, I said about the compatibility issue. If we enter in this discussion thinking whether who is compatible with whom, I think that we, we will end just in disagreement. Instead, if we accept that according to the problem in hand, we may be able to use one aspect. If I want to explain financial instability, uh, perhaps Minsky is useful. If I want to explain uh, uh, the inverse relationship between wages and profit, maybe Zrafa is more useful. So that's what I, I think that we try to put everything in, to have like the neoclassical, one general theory that it can process everything, the best we can then end up with is disagreement. Um, so that's a micro foundation. I don't think that the problem of Marshallian is micro foundation. Marshallian is a methodology, is a way of thinking, is a, um, which, uh, if someone comes from a Marxist of a different background, a continental background, doesn't have that kind of approach. It's not just the micro foundation, it's the way in which you conceive the working of the economy. Supply and demand is 
you know, uh, is not just the macro, because people could argue that Mar Marshall had a sort of a macro vision of the working of the economy, which was certainly macro founded, but it was also evolution. There was a lot of Marshall that has been discovered recently, in particular work done uh, showing that the evolutionary aspect of Marshallian economics is very important. It's not just uh, the tree in the forest. Uh, so I think that is a, a vision of, uh, there is the Spencerian element, um, you know, the, the effect. Uh, I mean, so Marshallian is a part of a, a back, intellectual background that is not the same as the continental one. So it's more than the micro foundation, I think. And I think that the Cambridge people um, were very much into that. They, um, hello? Yep. Something happened? No. No. Yeah, thank no, you. No, we still. Thank you. Did, did I manage to finish the sentence? OK. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Could hear you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we have a little over 10 minutes left. Um, I'll ask Alexander Pat Latoy and Ilhan Dogus, and if you can, um, yeah, just put your questions, we'll put them together. Yeah, thank you very much for an interesting presentation, maybe a bit dilettantish question, but if I got it correctly, you said that in the Kaletskian model, the actual level of production is determined by the intersection of the marginal labor cost curve, which is actually a straight line, and a marginal um, value, value added curve, yes? Uh, if I, yeah. Yes, so uh, here, because here it was discussed a question whether uh, Kaletsky was a supporter of Marxist uh, value theory. Isn't it uh, really an evidence that he is a macro foundation and the methodological foundations of his macroeconomic model laid in labor cost, um, uh, labor value theory? Because uh, otherwise he would have used absolutely another tools. Yes, for example, marginal variable costs, uh, marginal revenue, and as long as he used such uh, tools. Uh, isn't it an evidence that uh, his micro foundations were really in Marxist values here? Do you want me to collect the two the question? How, how do you want to do it, Maria Christina? We can. Well, I can answer that. Ke yeah. the Marx okay. was. Uh, uh, sorry, Kaleski, I think, was certainly not very keen on labor theory of value, as been said in the previous session that he felt that the, 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 the wage component, the labor component of cost was very important. And uh, he spent a lot of time in trying to prove that the, the, the labor cost tend to be uh, constant. There was no decrease in marginal productivity of labor. But I don't see any link whatsoever with the labor theory of value. And uh, I think that he, as far as I remember, he, he said it explicitly that he, he didn't buy everything. I, there is a, a very nice point that he, he said to John Robinson, he said, I like your little book on Marx, because unlike the Marxists, you, you, don't, you don't accept everything, but you try to make a distinction, what is good and what is bad. And my sense is that he felt that the labor theory of value was not the most important aspect of Marx theory. Ilhan, Douglas? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. I would uh, like to ask about another discussion topic between Keynes and Kaleski, which is the relationship between tax rate and investment. Indeed, as far as I know, uh, this topic was not also worked a lot uh, by post Keynes, post Kaleski, and maybe uh, scholars. Could you uh, elaborate a bit about that? What was the main uh, discussion issue which divide these two? Maybe because of Keynes' uh, Marshallian background or something like that. If I am uh, not mistaken, Kaleski argued that an increase in tax rate would not decrease the investment, indeed maybe increase because the capitalists would try to increase their investment expenditures to reach their profit targets, something like that. Well, certainly the approach to investment were very different between Kaleski and, and Keynes. 
for one thing, uh, Keynes again was, remember, it was marginal efficiency of investment. He has an inverse relationship between interest rate and investment. So again, he was relying on a some kind, even not similar notion of decreasing marginal productivity of capital. Then he gave a lot of importance to animal spirits, to the state of confidence and so on. While Kaleski stressed the role of finance. Um, so I think again, the, the, uh, the background of the way in which investment was uh, seen to be operating the system was different. But what is important that for both Kaleski and Keynes, the um, driving force of capital accumulation uh, was investment. And so for both of them, whatever their views or what are the real determinants of investment, it was that was the driving force that need to be um, uh, seen as the important factor in explaining uh, decrease in employment and, and accumulation. So even if they had a different way of conceptualizing the process by which investment was generated, they share the same strong conviction that investment was the driving force, needed to be the driving force. That's, I'd like to repeat a, uh, or quote a question from Jao Gabriel Nascimento del Almeida. Um, sorry if I mispronounce your name. Many economists see a difficulty in integrating investment unpredictability under the influence of Keynes's fundamental uncertainty and Kolesky's attempt to estimate a relatively stable investment decision curve. Have these differences been addressed in the Cambridge discussions? That's in the chat. Uh, I'm not sure I can answer this. Um, is that in that in the chat? I can't see it. Yeah, it's at 2.14 p.m. It's up. It's up? Yeah, 2.14 p.m. The last I have, uh, 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 did Kaleski say anything about uncertainty? I have um, a myth about that. And Amativa asked that as well. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I'm sorry. I, I didn't get the, the, the words of that. Uh, no, I, I think that Kaleski, of course, was, was aware of, I'm not, it doesn't come to my mind immediately. There is a particular passage in which he said, uh, uh, something about uncertainty. Certainly it was not as keen as, as Keynes in, in giving uncertainty such an, again, because uncertainty has to do with psychological factor, has to do with, uh, you know, a way of thinking of the working of the economy. I think Kaleski, which much more closer to historical materialism, was much more closer to Marx. And I think that he didn't give as much importance to psychological element as Keynes did. Jan Toporowski, would you like to ask? Oh, you're on mute. Unmute. Unmute, okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you very much for uh, all, you know, all your kind words uh, uh, about, uh, 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 about the biography. Uh, I will be writing more to you about, <laughs> about this after I've had a serious, uh, after I've had serious time to think about um, many of the things that you've uh, uh, you've said, but uh, uh, what I, I wanted to uh, just raise with you a you know much smaller question, which is uh, the one about Joan Robinson's attitude towards post Keynesianism. Somewhere I I had read that uh, when Joe when uh, Paul Davidson set up the the Journal of Post Keynesian Economics. Uh, he asked Joan Robinson for, for her support, and she was rather diffident about uh, supporting the enterprise because she didn't want uh, to have a, 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 a journal which was uh, focused on just one approach to, uh, uh, to economics or, uh, you know, or economic theory. I think her idea of, you know, people with whom she, she 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 would discuss was much broader, I think, than, uh, than 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 Paul Davidson's, and that that is why later on, um, after the changes in the Economic Journal, she uh, uh, she gave her support to the establishment of the Cambridge Journal of Economics. Um, 
I don't know whether you have it, you can throw any light on this. Well, um, I think that even when Axel Legendwood uh, came to Cambridge, they were not entirely happy with the way in which the American tradition for Doritson. I think the only person they trusted was Weintraub, Sidney Weintraub. Uh, but I don't think that they were very keen in either uh, Axel or um, Paul Davidson way of interpreting uh, Keynes. Of course, there is this Cambridge uh, thing that they know what Cambridge, what Keynes was about, and so. <laughs> Uh, I mean, it was very difficult to step on, on on this ground, generally speaking. I think the only exception was Jan Kregel, but he was a young guy and he was under their supervision. Of course, Mogridge, but there are very, very few people outside Cambridge that they would trust as being, even Lerner, in the end, he was culpable of having translated the general theory into many diagrams and so forth. So the exp I, I don't know in particular the story about the journal, but I know for certain that there was always suspicious of interpretation of Keynes and development of Keynesian economics, which were not strictly under their supervision. <laughs> so we have just two minutes left. Um, there, there are some questions in the in the well, just one from Emma Teva, which maybe Marie Christina can um, have a look later on. And I'll just quickly end with Emiliano Vargas. Do you want to ask your question, or should I speak it out? No, I can read it. I can read it. Yeah. Oh, I cannot answer this question. There might, but I'm not the. I would. I would not know um, about Kaleski and Veblen about consumer behavior. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, um, I might, it might not, but I don't know. Sorry, I cannot answer this question. That's all right. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you very um, much. Thank you. Marie Christina, this was such a fascinating session. And we now have a 15 minute break. And uh, I will let Louis Philippe discuss. He's, you're on mute. Yeah. Thank you very much, Leanne. Um, great to see you and thank you for sharing this session.